Yes, shalom, Chavarim, shalom. This is Yadon, Yadon right here. Let's speak about free will. been hearing ones and ones, I think another debate, another debate <laughs> going on on whether we have free will or not. You know, according to the Bible, some say that, well, the Bible or the God of the Bible, I guess from the KJV Christian, you know, um, perspective, you know, from the nowadays perspective of what we call um, Christianity. And we put it within the context of, you know, the point of reference that most people have a point of reference to. And that point of reference is the King James Version. There's, you know, for most ones. So most of these ideas that have been formed or even deformed over time has a lot to do with the King James, the KJV Version. So ones and ones are debating again whether man, whether people have, like human beings have free will or from a biblical perspective. You know, they're saying like, well, from a biblical perspective, whether you have free will. So the the implied idea is that, well, this if you if you're about the Bible as a Christian or whether a Hebrew, you know, or even a, you know, if if you believe in the Bible or that's your perspective, right? Then the God of that Bible don't give you free will. And so this is an interesting subject matter. We've addressed this before, but we've thought on this and we've meditated this and we've studied on this particular subject matter and it's very interesting what the bible really does say like do you have free will now from a biblical perspective some people outside of the biblical perspective there's philosophical perspectives concerning free will right so there are certain philosophical ideas so there's a within the biblical context idea of whether you know whether the believer so to speak you know, whether it's Old Testament, you know, Israelite or Hebrew or Jewish or whether it's um, one might say New Testament, you know, Christian doesn't have free will. So this is that that's what the debate, I think, in the Pasha Da and then um, I think the Pasha Da is going to be debating the the black bishop, um, black Jesus, black Jesus minister, you know, on this particular subject matter. And I was listening, you know, just listening, listening to the back and forth between the Pasha da and her perspective of free will in the Bible, saying, well, you don't have free will in the Bible because, you know, you have basically saying you don't got no choice. And it's interesting because here we're in the Torah reading and feeding right here. The Chavarim know we're in this Torah reading and feeding. Let's bring this up right here before we just go to some of our exhibits. Some of this was here for another video, but we'll use this right here. So do we have free will? Right? Is there free will? So how should we approach this question? If we look at it within the context of the Bible, or we're looking at it into the context of um, a secular, so-called secular, like in the secular world, there's some who speak and argue whether there is free will, and some say that free will is an illusion, right? Hmm, interesting. We're going to look at it within the scriptural context right here concerning free will, right? But of course, this begins from certain misconceptions ones have of the Bible. And I'm sincerely persuaded that certain ones who are debating this do have misconceptions. You know, serious misconception. As we hear them speak on different various issues, it's like the conceptions become compounded. And almost like one misconception leads to another misconception. And many people, they kind of sum up that misconception. In other words, they are, you know, because they have misconceptions too. So when I look at someone and I say, wow. This video, that video, they got a lot of hits. Like, what are they talking about? Listen to them. It's like, wow, these people really know nothing about what they're talking about. They are arguing within the narrow frame of their ignorance. When I say ignorance, I'm saying what they don't know. So when ones like Nepal Shada and even others, I'm not just saying her, but saying that she's having this debate with black Jesus ministers, say that, well, from the biblical perspective, you know, she's putting her crown and everything on the line, I guess. And um, black Jesus minister, he's, he's taking this up. But I'm taking up the point and the reason about free will. Now, whether you want to check that out or not, or you agree with this one or that one, we can reason on that hopefully another time. But we're speaking about this whole free will concept, right? So does the Bible, does the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, does the Bible and the God of the Bible, do you have free will according to the Bible and the God of the Bible? Now, we would say absolutely yes, you do. In the context of the Bible, and this is just talking about the King James Version. Even the King James Version, 
you will read and if you study and you can read in context because we find that a lot of ones are going forward into some prophets verses in the prophets or they're getting some verse in the new testament but we need to go to the groundation because i think what they really are talking about is ha torah they're talking about the torah basically you know they're talking about we as hebrews and even of the royal order of the ethiopian hebrews and as israelites this is what they're speaking about Right? They're saying that, well, this thing that y'all believe in the Bible, well, the God of the Bible don't give you any free will. You don't have no free will. You got to do this. Right? There's no choice because God, he's omniscient. He's omnipotent. He knows this. And they pointed some verses like if something happens in a city. You remember the verse? I think it's, what was it Amos? Where it talk about has not like evil. Like you talk about evil. Like he created evil. And it says he created evil. You know, he knew them you in the womb. Oh, he knew you in the womb. So that means you really have no choice about it. You know, they take certain prophetic verses. And it's very pathetic. They're missing to, because they have no groundation. This is what it means in the scripture when it says unstable and unlearned. Right? Unstable and unlearned. You know, ones who are unstable. And we say unlearned and what? Many ones will tell you they know this Bible. Oh, we know this Bible. Even with Sa, Sanetta, you know, quote some verses. People give him verses. He go back and forth and debate certain Hebrews or Israelites or this one and that one. <laughs> now, now he knows the Bible. Well, I guess from the KJV, the King James or the, the English, the translation. You've heard the expression before, lost in translation. Mm. I'm seeing so much of this nowadays especially as ones and ones are debating points concerning the bible concerning free will though sonetta did make a good answer you know to one question that black jesus minister asked him do you have free will right now nepal tried to say a couple of things you know to put it in context <laughs> you know what i'm saying and um he, he said something interesting he said basically like um like no right at first and then when it was more pointed right now on this platform do you have free will say yes you know, and then he said it, it all depends. I said, that's, that's, that's beautiful right there. You know, that's beautiful. Though we may disagree on other things, that right there I, I agree on. Like, it all depends. All depends on what? All depends on what we're talking about. Like, if you go to jail, right, or prison, rather, right, you know, you get convicted and you have to do time in prison, then a lot of things in prison in that context is regulated. So, one has free will according to measure. Everything is in measure. It says do all things in moderation. You know, notice that this idea of free will, I didn't touch on this before in another video regarding like free will. There's a free will offering even in the Bible. We want to break that down. But I don't know whether this is going to enter in any of the debate. So what else is about an offering? But the offering is called a free will offering. What does a free will offering mean? When people say, well, from the biblical perspective, one don't have free will. From a biblical perspective, one don't have free will. All right? There's no such thing as free will. You got to do what God says, you know, otherwise. Well, is that is that correct? Well, no, that's not correct. And we're going to show this right here. All right? This is an interesting verse right here. And a woman shall come past a man. Listen to one's dote about as to what they think that means. And yes, from an English perspective, you absolutely get confused. Right? You know, if you have an imaginative mind. But as you study it, you begin to see the context of the language and the context of what it's really saying. But if you already have a, um, you know, how can I say, you already have a, a um, what, modus operandi forethought. You know, you have a, a MO before, you know, hand. Then you probably would try to swerve it this way or that way. Now, of course, people may say that about us. But no, I, I take this up just as it is. It's a good question. You know, did somebody ask a question about something and I got this all wrong? Maybe I did. You know, so this is why I'm bringing this forward to y'all so that ones can be iron sharp and iron. Ones can be a little more sharper, right? So free will. Look, there's free will offering in the Bible. What is free will? Let me ask the question. With a free will offering in the Bible, do you have to give this? See, everything has a context. We're not going to get into that micro management of the details, but everything has a context, right? Like I said, speak to Aaron. And his son didn't say speak to this one and that one. No, speak to Aaron, right? And then it says, and to all the children of Israel, the children of Israel, the Bnei Yisrael. A lot of people get this confused and everything. They'll say it's talking about the sons and the daughters. No, mainly it's speaking about the sons, the male children, to whom more is given, more is required. See, there's a context and the order that counterfeit Christianity, you know, 
um, and, the, and many of the so-called churches, they don't teach you this. You know, a fast song, they give you a fast song, a slow song, a preach, pass around the, bu the I was in the bucket, the basket. You know, get the tithe and it's out of there and continue. We'll do this next week sometime. You know what I'm saying? But here it's saying right here, it's saying, and say to them, what, whatsoever he be. Now, remember, this is old King Jamesian, right? It, it really reads much different in the Hebrew, though sometimes the general context is similar. Whatsoever he be of the Beit Yisrael. Now, the Beit Yisrael is the house of Israel. This includes the men, right? It includes the woman and the children. But when it says children of Israel, it's speaking specifically to the sons of Israel because the responsibility of fallen man. Let me say that again. Because the responsibility of fallen man, right? Y'all know, or some of y'all know, you know, our perspective on the Gan Ba'ed in the Garden of Eden. Right? That the one that was in, you know, you say the most trespass, as it were, right, based on the narrative was Adam. Adam, people in counterfeit Christianity, they blamed the woman. Oh, the woman got us in this situation because she ate, she listened to the serpent. Well, Adam was the one, according to the Bible, that was given the commandment. Mm -hmm. Wasn't he? Yeah, he might have told Hawa, Eva, Zoe, as, her, as she may be called, Eve, about it. Right? But this is before she wasn't called Eve. She was called the Eshet, the Oset, the Isha, the woman, his wife. He says, you are Isha because you come from Ish. You know what I mean? Very interesting, the whole reasoning there. The Isha and the Eshet and the Oset and the woman. Right? But here it says, whatsoever he be of the Bait Yisrael, the Bait, the house, the Bait of Israel, or of the strangers in Yisrael. These are like other peoples right? who are not, you could say, um, descendants, right, of Yaakov, of Jacob, of, of the man named Jacob called Yisrael, right, with a new name, right, that will offer his oblation. What's the oblation? A korban. The korban, korban or korban. This is different accents. The different pointing is a different accent. As we speak English, many of us people speak different in different places, and you can go through all of that right there. An offering. So basically, it's a korban. Right? It's a korban. And what does a korban mean? Strong's bring this out correctly according to the etymology and according to the Hebrew, the science of the linguistics brought near. Right? Because it comes from the H7126, karab, karab. Like the Amharic kareb, kareb. Karab means to come near. Now they have the martial arts, Israeli street fighting that's called krav maga. Krav, right? Maga. Krav maga. To draw near and like to juke in a sense, right? To come near. But here is to come near before the public altar, the Mizbeach, right? And to present a sacrificial present, right? Notice this right here. Here it says, for all his vows, right? Offer a korban for all his vows and for all his free will offering. Free will offering. We study the principle of free will offering. What is the free will offering? The free will offering is called the nedaba. The Nadaba, Nadaba, Nadava, modern Hebrew Nadava. The Nadaba. What is the Nadaba? It's voluntariness. What does it mean to be voluntary? Do I have to do something if it's voluntary? Huh? Do let me ask the question again, because it's a question about whether there's free will, the God of the Bible, the God of the Bible, free will and God of the Bible. Is there free will? Well, of course, even in the narrative, if we just look at it as the narrative, there is what? Voluntariness. If something is voluntary, it's like I used to go to the museums a lot, right? And especially some of the museums in New York. Some ones might know this as well. When you used to go to the museum, I don't know if it's still the same, right? It might be. They have a suggested donation. You ever see that? Suggested donation. Somebody put me up on this. Sometimes I would go to the museum so often. And, you know, I would, I would spend money. But going back and back and back, a lot of times if I pay the suggested donation, I didn't, I didn't really have that. And maybe I want to spend on something else. I'll give something to keep up the museum so forth and so on. But then somebody peeked me to game. They say, wait, do you know that suggested donation, it means just that? I said, what? It, it means suggested. You mean, what do you mean suggested? Well, you don't really have to give. The suggested donation is like $5. I can give $1, $2. Right or three dollars. Right, especially if I got two or three people with me, we give one dollar for each. And even if the person there looks at me, I point to suggested. See, if you understand the context of what the word suggested means, suggested donation, right, means that they suggest that you give you give this, but it means that you can't be barred if you don't. Can you remember back in the days you used to get this little like little pin? Right, that clips on your you clip it on your clothing. So when you're walking around, you know the guards might look for this pin. 
right? But the point about it, it is suggested. So if something is voluntary, do I have to do this? So this right here, this destroys that whole argument. This is one point here. It wasn't even a major point concerning free will, you know, and the Bible. Do you have free will? Good answer. It all depends, right? It all depends. It really all depends. As we go deep into this particular subject matter, Right? We want to go to the very beginning, like the Torah, first of all. A lot of people, like I said, like to go to the prophets, and they misinterpret many of the prophetical oracles. See, if the prophetical oracles were understandable by all, then the confusion that we find in response to the prophetic oracles, even in the purported time that they were given, would not be there. So ones and ones act like they, you know, they, they're interpreters of prophecy when they don't even have a good groundation in Torah. We got to point this out. You know, a good groundation Torah. They're reading a translation. Yes, we all are reading a translation, but some of us recognizing who we are. You know, as the word says, even the New Testament, study to show yourself approved. So do you have to do something? If it's voluntary, do you have to do it? Yeah, I give one a little bit of time. You can look it up on the calculator if you need to, you know, to get the right answer. If something is voluntary, do you have to do it? See, it's voluntariness. Right? Voluntary, free will, voluntariness, free will. You see what it says? The B is free will, voluntary. Right? Now it's an offering, but the offering is a voluntary. Then we get to the root of the word nadaba. Nadava, nadaba. Come from nadab. Remember, there was um, two sons of Aharon. They had got burnt on the same day. They got their burn notice on the same day that they was consecrated. Right? Why? Because they exercise, I won't call it their free will. Well, maybe it was free will, right? They exercise their will, right? And they went to offer the Aishans, right? Even though the commandment for offering the Aishans had not come forward. And they went into, you know, the holy place, you know, to burn the Aishans. They went there with strange fire and they got burnt. This is what a lot of folks, right, are doing. And this is what's going to happen to a lot of folks, right, if they don't receive the warning. They're going to get psychologically burned because you're playing with fire. Doesn't he say that his word is a fire, right? And if you play with fire, what does they say? You get burned, right, to play with fire. So Nadab, Nadab means what? Nadab means to incite, to impel, to make willing, right? So to incite, to impel, to make willing, right? How many times have you know that you shouldn't do something or you was told not to do something you did i mean look at adam adam expresses free will right according to the translation the king james version in the very beginning doesn't he he's told in genesis chapter 2 not to eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil and in genesis chapter 3 he eats of the knowledge of the the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. of course after eve and everyone blames eve for it but was eve given the commandment now, if you think that, 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 that Eve was created from a rib, like actual rib, rib, like King James translation translate, rib, rib, <laughs> a rib, rib, right? A rib, rib, instead of the tsela, the tsela, tsela. Interesting how that word is used elsewhere in the Hebrew. See, one's need to do due diligence so one can get the context, the true context. You can play games all you want with the King James Version, you know, because in a sense, that's what the people have been doing. They've been playing games with it. But you really can't play those games so easily with the Hebrew because there is more of a context to things. But even if you have wisdom, right? Wisdom, right? Chokmah, the mother. Wisdom is justified by all of her children, right? So children, children, willing to make willing. If you are incited or impelled, like somebody is impelled or compelled to do something. If you volunteer. If I volunteer to do something, did I have to do that? Now, one say, well, God knew that you was going to do it. And such. See, they're playing games. They're misinterpreting, twisting verses out of their context. That's what they're doing right there. Right? So even if he knows you're going to do it, right, you got to do it. You didn't have a choice. There's no choice factor. With Adam, there was no choice factor, even if right, Yahuwah, Ha'ilehim, Eloheinu, right, knew, right? And accordingly, we would say that he did know, right, if he is... Uh, omni, omniscient, omniscience, like, you know, all knowing, then definitely he knew. To offer free will offerings. If I offer a free will offering, did I have to offer it? See, we didn't even get to like give the top. We're just using this as, oh, Nadava is also feminine, right? That's all on show right here, feminine. So that sounds like somebody trying to bring in misogyny, 
when I say misogyny, right? Going against the fact that there's free will. There's free will right there. The free will offering is she Nadava. It's spontaneity. You ever did something spontaneous? Uh, spontaneous? <laughs> do you ever do anything spontaneous? Did you, um, I, um, well, you're going to do that before you just got the will to do it. So you acted off of your will. Now, see, what it is, it's like before it used to be the devil made me do it. People like the devil made me do it. Now they're trying to flip it, right, in this end time of the time of the nation, the Gentiles. They're trying to flip it and say, well, God made me do it. I did it because God, he know everything. You think that's going to be a good excuse even for your soul? I mean, for your own psyche? That's what we say. If you play with fire, his word is a fire, right? They haven't received direction, instruction, because otherwise one would not even pose something so silly if you are in the truth right you would not be posing it out of the truth and answering it out of the truth let's go to leviticus if we go to leviticus chapter one leviticus chapter one right something about leviticus chapter one let's go all the way down here to leviticus chapter one right leviticus chapter one and this is what we know as um um the safer wayikra the key word is called the kara kara wayikra Right, and he who be who he be called right to Moses, Moshe, and spake to him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, the Ohel Moed, Lemor, saying, He says, Speak to the Bene Yisrael. So, who is being spoken to? Everybody in the world? No. It says, Speak to who? The children, the sons of the children of Yisrael, and say to them, See, what well, people don't know that even in the Hebrew, we have the male and the female. My um, um, polarity and gender dynamics, right? Even in the um, word, right? So the context becomes very, very clear. That's what it says. If any man, right? It says if any Adam. They didn't say Adama. They didn't say. It didn't say uh, Isha to say the woman, right? It says if any Adam, right? If any who? If any Adam. Remember what Adam said? You are woman, Isha in the Hebrew, because you came out of man, Ish. He didn't say you are Adama because you came out of Adam. Do you know why? This is what we study to understand why. If, notice the key operative word right here is if. Does not if imply a choice factor? If implies a choice factor. It says if any man of you bring an offering like Yahuwah to Jehovah, ye, y'all, you all, speaking to the males, shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd, and of the flock. Now, did they have to bring an offering? It says if, right? Let's go right here just to the Hebrew for a moment right here, just for ones and ones, because we're not playing fast and loose with this, but we like to go through this at a good a good clip, right? Here we have um right here. It says right here, it says, it says, it says, Dabir illa bene Israel we Amarta. Um, speak Daber il to Bene Israel, the sons of Israel, with and Amarta, and say Elehem, and say to him, and say to them, Adam, right, man, right, Adam, key for or the context of the key here is if. Let's bring this up right here. The key is this word right here, the H thirty-five eighty-eight. It's an interesting context. Anybody who understands the Hebrew, right? For, because, because, except, surely. But the context in Hebrew, right? The force in the Hebrew is as we have it down there. That if. The context is for if. Indeed, if. Right? For though, but if. Right? So the sense here is if. Right? The context here is clearly if. Ki yakrib. If you bring near, right, me camp from you all, karban, a offering, a karban, la Yahuwah, right, for he who be who he be, mean from ha behema, behema, like the cattle, mean ha bakar, like the, you can say the, the oxen, right there, ua mean ha tzon, tzon, like the sheepfold. Takribu, takribu, all of y'all, right? Takribu, el karbanekem, karbanekem, right? Right, so right here, 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 the offering, right, that you offers a offering, 
All right, you shall offer your offering. That last part right there, takribo. So it goes from the 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 kind of um, he who be who he be speaking to Moses, for him to say to them, right? But when he says to them, he calls them Adam, and Adam is like the basic man. It's like almost like generic man because here he's bringing the Israelites as a symbol for humanity, bringing them up from that fallen state of consciousness, not giving them something outside of their concept. They are already in the concept of sacrifices and offerings, right? We don't have in the very beginning, we see even Cain and Abel, they have sacrifices and offering, which makes one question, well, hmm, did he who be who he be say to them to do sacrifice and offering? It seemed like they understood what sacrifice and offering was. So one can ask the question, where does sacrifice and offering come from? A simple answer right here, from the fall, what's known as the fall, or what we have within the Masha, right? We say even the parable, so to speak, right, of the Gan Ba'eden, of the Garden of the Lights, the Garden of Eden. That's where the sacrifice occurred. In fact, that eating of that fruit, right, and the shame about their nakedness being exposed, right, is all connected with that, right? He clothed them with skins, right? The sacrifice, they sacrificed where they were, right, by their fall. In other words, they killed themselves. They were dead. People don't recognize that they were dead. They were dead compared to the state that they were in, right? And this is why the very next chapter, you have some craziness happens, Right? What happens? Adam knows his wife, right? His Isha, Hawa, Eve, right? And then she she begets, right? She begets Ayan, Cain, right? And she says that she has gotten a man of Yahweh, right? Of Jehovah. He proves to be the first murderer, right? According to the biblical narrative. This is why Robeno Yeshua said to the Pharisees and scribes, Y'all are of your father the devil right he was what what from the beginning a murderer see when it says from the beginning in the hebrew context we know the first book is known as well in the translation quote the beginning right bereshis is known as bereshis from the beginning so who was the first murderer now when abel when abel was born right after Kayan, what did Hawa say hmm do i hear crickets Hawa said nothing Right? How was it not? Now, who was the righteous one? Even in the New Testament says, and the righteous Abel, the righteous Abel. Abel is called the righteous. So there was a proclamation, almost you could say a blessing, right? And the name of Yahweh was proclaimed over who? Kayan, who ended up being the murderer of his brother, right? But now the narrative, as we follow it through, teaches that Abel was the right one. So how is the wrong one getting, you see, they were dead. They were dead. And this is why, you know, in that sense, death begets death <laughs> as true life begets true life. So death begets death. Right? They already had died. You see, we as Hebrews, we understand that and we understood that from before. Reading the King James Version, yeah, it's dubious because you read this King, you know, you read this English here, you read other English, and you basically try to interpret the Bible, you know, from the same kind of English that you read elsewhere. But the Bible itself is a translation. Many of those other things, they originated, right, with English speakers in, in English. So it's a different sense there. Whenever you're getting a translation of something, you always have to ask, right, how accurate is this, right, with the original? We're not talking about literally, right? We even talk about figuratively or according to the spirit of the word. So is there free choice, right? Is there free choice? We start out with the free will, right? The whole free will offering, right? Because I just think that's ironic there that right there in the Bible there's a free will offering. And if you study the context of the free will offering, right, they could give it whenever they will. Right? Whenever they will. So do people have free will? Well, of course people have free will, but, but it all depends. Not all will, right? Not all will, not all, not all people's will is free will, right? In other words, some people's will is under the determiner of other people's will. So some are trying to put forth the rhetoric that the, the God of the Bible, so to speak, right, does not give free will. Right. So here, let's let's put this here so we can see right here what it says right here. Let's put choose life. 
right? Choose life. Now, we're not talking about the whole abortion debate, but even there, you know, one, one should, you know, choose life. All right, boom, choose life. So there's two verses. There's Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. And for this Shabbat Shuvah, Sabbath of return, it's interesting. This is the Torah reading and feeding. You know, this connects right here with the season that we're in. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. Right? Moshe here is speaking. He says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you, he's speaking to this new generation of Israelites, namely and mainly the, the Bnei Yisrael, the sons of that generation that wandered to death in the wilderness 40 years, you know, because obviously they expressed their will, right? But their will that they freely expressed was the wrong will, right, to express. It was the wrong will for them to enter in. And it's like a contract. Imagine you have a contract. We cut a contract, a, a, a covenant, but let's call it a contract. We have an agreement, right? And you pay me to do something for ye, right? Or for you, right? And um, I decide later on, right, that I'm going to just not do it. Did I express my free will, right? Can, you, can one just change the terms of the contract and not expect a consequence, you know, like, okay, I get, I get some service, some utility service. I decide, well, you know what? I'm not going to pay. I'm not going to pay my bill. What's going to happen? All right? And then I'm going to act like, well, I didn't have no free will, you know, because God said, you know, that sounds mad. It sounds ridiculous. Remember the fire we spoke about, right? Because his word is a fire. Here, Moshe says, I've set before you life and death, all right? Blessing and cursing. In other words, life and death. The choice is like between life, right? the direction instruction, taking heed to direction instructions, right? And death, and basically your will, you know, exercise otherwise, right? So that's a, that's a choice here, right? Blessing and curse. You didn't say, well, I said before you life, you got to do this. You don't got no choice about it. No, life and death. In other words, if I know there's a, if that's a cliff over there and you just keep walking and it's dark out, I know there's a cliff over there. I said, don't walk over there, right? You know, and now you walk over there. I didn't say you could die or you could live. But I said, just don't walk over there. There's a cliff over there. And you said, no, 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 no. I don't think so, right? And you keep walking over there. And you fall off the cliff. Did you have any free will? You had, you had free will. I mean, you could have continued, but maybe been a little cautious. You know, if, if it was me, maybe I would crawl on the ground. In a sense, you know what I mean? And I know somebody's going to say the, the whole serpent thing, right? Well, it, I recognize the reptilian. <laughs> you know, I recognize that. I tame that reptilian. You know, you got to recognize that right there. Be wise as serpent, harmless as dove. So you have before you, according to what Moshe and what's here in the Torah, life and death, blessing and cursing. This is what's said. This is a two, right? It's, it is a twofold metaphor. Life and, and blessing is connected, and death and consequence, right, is connected, right? Therefore, choose life. So now Moshe here, he says, choose life. He says, choose life. You know what I mean? Basically, he's saying that, you know, with this choice that you have, the choice factor. You know, I would remind ones of the Matrix movie. Remember the architect in the Matrix? In fact, now thinking about this, I would have got one of the pictures, one of the stills of the architect, you know, in the Matrix. Remember, it was all about the choice factor, right? The choice factor demonstrates that one has a measure of will that one can call it free will, right? And that which they would willingly express to do or not to do, right? All of us have measures of will. Some people's will is more so than other people's will. So not everybody, I would admit, has the same kind of free will. <clears throat> For example, someone incarcerated, you or me not incarcerated, who has more of a measure, even that incarcerated person has a measure of will, right, that they can exercise freely to do or not to do, However, it's a limited, it's a more limited because of their condition, their circumstance, right? Because the condition and the circumstance, their will, right, is, is, is more so or is less so. So the incarcerated person, right, one in prison, right, even there they have will, right? They can, they can will to, 
Oh, man, you know, a lot of stuff that goes on in prison. One's will to do it. Sometimes they fall under somebody else's will. Even being incarcerated, you are under someone else's will. You know, when you got to go to sleep, lights out at this time, when you wake up, when you go to the yard, when this, when that, when the next thing, when you eat. You know what I'm saying? So they even have will because, you know, does the prison tell you necessarily to, you know, shank somebody? You, you shank somebody because... You know, even if it's to get into a protection, you know, you are deciding to do that. You say, I don't have no choice. Yes, you do. You don't have to get into that protection. Maybe you get shanked. But now you get shanked, you, you, you shank someone else, then you basically have, just using this as an example, brothers and sisters, you know, you know, to look at the real situation in life. Like someone incarcerated, you know, loses a lot of their freedom and depends on what kind of crime they have committed. You know, we know they lose other rights in society. We're not debating whether that necessarily should be or should not be. But here it says, therefore, choose life. They say if you do the crime, you know, if you want to do the crime, you must do the time, so to speak. But now in the bigger view of life, life is like a test and examination. We do have measures of choice, right? And the scripture, right, the Bible and the God of the Bible, right, gives such free will. But man, because of his disobedience, right, to truth, he limits himself. He actually loses his free will. He kind of sells himself. He kind of, hita makartem. You know, he sells himself into what we can call slavery on the next level, beyond the inferiority posing as supremacy, so-called white supremacy, beyond that, that metaphor there, beyond that even, I guess, reality right there. Right. So he says, therefore, choose life. So when I've heard this debate or heard this, I said, wow, isn't this interesting? Right? Of course, one's going to strain on certain verses. Cause we already heard them going back and forth, you know, trying to eke out from the opponent. You know, like, what do you think about this verse? What do you think about that verse? How about this verse? That both thou and thy seed may live. So here, through the revelation given to Moshe, right, that, that, that we say omniscience, Right, that all knowing of he who be who he be given to Moses in the Torah direction instruction, he is now instructing and advising a new generation of Israelites. This is the situation. Before every man, as I and I as Rastafari, we say there's a chant, right? Before every man, there's two ways. Before every man, there's two ways. This is why when we started out the vlog right here, we actually, well, you see the free will right here. This is one of the kind of links for a more thorough discussion. But let's go back to, you know, the beginning. And yeah, we're going all the way to the beginning, right? <laughs> or to close to the beginning, right? Here we have the maka, right? The maka, 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 maka. Right here we have the scales, the maka. Right here from ancient Mitzrayim, right in the Meshkinet, right in that judgment hall. But this is some it's like the blue pill and the red pill, so to speak, right? The choice factor, right? The binary system. People are anti-binary on some le levels of their um, choice factor or their situation, their condition. But notice that even the technology is binary. If it was to be non-binary. As the technology is non-binary, we couldn't even be having this discussion or we couldn't even be sharing this right here. You couldn't be watching it because your computer would not work. The computer, based in technology, works on this one and zero, one and zero, yes and no. You know, we could say almost like male and female, yes and no, one and zero. You, you know, this alternation right there. Basically a binary system. And that in itself, even the technology, has levels of will where you are able to do this, right, if the conditions exist, but you are not able to do that if the condition exists. So even on that level, there is measures of free will. But here, let's just sum this up right here, right, for right now, right? Even, okay, right, this is another quote about choosing life right here, but let's, right here, he says, okay, it's Job 7.15, so that my soul chooseth strangling and death, rather than my life. That's interesting. See, Job understood this, this matter. Eob, right, he says, and this is one of the oldest books in the Bible. We base that on the, the archaicness, right, of the linguistic, of the Hebrew, right, and even some kind of Aramaic-isms, right? But it says, so that my soul chooseth, 
my strangling, my psyche, she, my soul, she, nefesh, she, in me. So even when one's tried to talk about, oh, the Bible is misogynistic, the Bible has deceived, you know, people talk about, I heard somebody say the Bible, you know, the Bible deceived them. I said, the Bible is just a book, right? No, your ignorance, what you didn't know, deceived you. Right? Or maybe a pastor or a preacher or a person right? misrepresenting, even in their ignorance, maybe they deceive you. But here it's the noun feminine, the breathing creature, right? his psyche. It's like we say the psyche, right? whether you look at it as the mind right? from the secular right? or in the, in, the temple, in, in, in the temple context, right? the psyche, the soul. Right? Choose it. So the soul, she can choose. You're going to say the soul, she don't have a choice. The soul, no, she has a choice. Right? You may have been made to believe you don't have a choice. And you might not have a choice. Depends. It all depends. That my soul here, Job says that his soul chooses strangling and death rather than my life. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, very interesting word. But here, the word life here is somewhat um, pseudonymous. I say Sodom most falsely named in the translation. Life in the Hebrew is Chai, Chai, and Chayim, right, are two of the main forms, right, Chai. Here we have the word Etzem, Etzem. What's Etzem? Etzem is bone, essence, substance, bone, limb, marrow, self, substance. It's also a noun feminine. But this word is the basic word Etzem for bone, right? So look at the King James Version again. The King James Version is, so that my soul chooseth, right, bachar, right, bacharta, bachayim, choose life, chooseth strangling and death rather than my life, rather than etzem. And what's etzem? Etzem is bone, right, bone. And the bone in the sense, right, of being strong. By extension, the body, my bone, my structure. Figuratively, in the figurative sense, in the second of the two truths, Right? There's the literal, right? And the letter, and but then there's the spirit of the word. That's the substance, right? Like the self saying the substance. So it's interesting here how they brought out this translation. Now I want to speak just briefly to a condition that was revealed to me in studying the Brit Khadasha. So if you know that the Torah, for example, the Israelites, they were commanded to do one thing and they did the next thing. That in itself expresses that they had some measure of a will, right? And they were, could choose it freely, right? They could basically freely choose. You know, we see that. We see plenty of examples from the very first example I gave you. That's the Adam example right there. He, not Adam and Eve, you know, right? Because she, according to scripture, was in him. We look at it more like the chromosomes. But let's just say she was in him, but he was the conscious being that was being spoken to. Right? And he did what? And he violated what he was told to do. We said, well, because of the reasoning of the serpent, because of his wife, so forth and so on. Yeah, because of all of that. But he could have said, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. Right? He made a choice. Like the matrix, there's a choice factor. Right? Um, that they may recover themselves out of the sneer of the devil. Let's go right there. That they may recover themselves. Recover, recover. That they may recover themselves. Let's go to recover Right, and let's put them, right, that they may recover themselves. There's ten verses right here. We're gonna go to the last verse right here. Right, first, um, first Timothy chapter two verse twenty six, and we're gonna seal it up right here. Hopefully, we'll seal this up. And the servant of Adonai of Yahweh, right, of Jehovah, must not strive, but be gentle to all men, apt to teach patient in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves one of the reasons why we did this video when we heard about this debate again the free will debate that has been debated so many times whether people have free will they don't have free will the context i think that's upcoming for a debate is um whether um whether the god of the bible like they some are saying that in the bible sense right there's no free will right in the bible sense because it's predestination you know they get caught up on what you know, Rabbi Shaul, a.k.a. Paul, was bringing out, right? But remember what Paul said his background, his upbringing was, right? Those of us who have that study, that groundation, we understand the context of what he was saying concerning the predestinate. Because they look it up, what predestination mean? So they're trusting the translator to accurately translate, even in the Koine Coptic Greek, what was there. 
right? And we just showed you just now in the Job quote that where it says my life, it actually to be my bone, my, my bone or my substance in the sense of my bone, my structure, my bone, right? But here in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, right? To the Chabarim, when you minister this word or share this word, people might oppose it. Don't take it personal. Remember what Rav Shaul, a.k.a. the Apostle Paul, taught his disciple, right? Timothy here, he says, in meekness, right? In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. So those who oppose the truth that we speak are not opposing I and I. They're really opposing themselves. They're opposing their best interests. If, you see that word if? So we see the word if right here. So we know there's a if. Me pote, me pote, right? In the sense of the former quote, the key. If, hi lehem, if the almighty power, right? Elohim, per adventure. What does per adventure mean? Per adventure, right? Per adventure is the if too. Notice that it's if, if, right? It's a conjunction, perhaps, perhaps. You see it right down there, perhaps. If Elohim, perhaps, will give them repentance. Uh-oh, season, reason, teshuba, to turn from the astray way. With Zoha Derek, and this is the way, Jaway, truth and life, to make those adjustments before the judgment. But notice the language here. This is him giving instruction, right? You know, even he's saying here, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, right? One could consider this a foolish and an unlearned question, but this is a this is a teaching vlog right here, right? Knowing that they do gender strifes. Right, you know, the ones and ones debating, right? How how does that go? Right? And it seems as though what Paul said elsewhere, forever learning but not coming to the acknowledgement of the truth, seems to be the condition. This is why it says to us in meekness, instructing those that oppose himself. Right? Don't get deceived that when they oppose you, because the truth in you, right, which is the almighty truth, that they're opposing you, but they're opposing themselves. That's why it says in meekness, why? Because our deportment is important to, you know, we know it's, 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 it's foolish, it's, it's, it's stupid. So, you know, but if we even say that too much, right, then they'll have an excuse, right, to stay in bondage with no willpower or try to pretend like they don't got no willpower to try to pretend that free will is a delusion, right? Because they're actually in the delusion. And we're going to show you how they got into this delusion, this verse here or this End of this chapter here, Second Timothy chapter 2. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if Elohim, peradventure, which means perhaps, maybe, will give them repentance. Wait, hold on for a moment. Isn't repentance, is it the metanoia? Metanoia, a change of mind. You ever wonder why some people forever learn and never can come to the truth? Because that, that requires a change of mind to shoo but a turn. They, they're not able. They don't have the power to turn. They know they're going in the wrong way, but they don't have the power to turn, right? As it appears to one who repents, a purpose, right, has formed, that he has formed or something he has done, right? So they set themselves. It's like they get stuck, right? People say they get stuck. So when we find these people that get stuck, even though they oppose the truth tellers, right, they're opposing themselves. That's why Paul says, if Hilehim perhaps will give them repentance. See, this brings out a whole other theological concept right here, right? Are people able to repent? Why don't some people repent? Why can't some people change their mind? According to this verse, it would be implied that Elohim has not given them repentance for what purpose? A change of mind to what purpose? To the acknowledging of the truth. So it's not like you have not spoken the truth. That's always says they oppose themselves. It's not like they have not heard the truth, but they can't really act on that knowledge. See, what's the word acknowledge? It's epinosis. People talk about the Gnostics. So right here, the Gnostic connection, right, with even the so-called canonical scripture when we get to the Koine Greek, the epinosis, the epinosis. You know what the epinosis is? Gnosis is knowledge, and epi has a sense of full, it has a sense of like full, complete knowledge, precise and correct knowledge. This is using the Brit Hadasha, the new covenant sense of the knowledge of things ethical and divine. So for one to say right, that, well, the so-called God of the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, does not give, you know, people or Israel or humanity free will. <laughs> 
Whether you know it or not, even animals have the lower animals, that is, they have the chayim, they have a measure of free will too. Although they are heavily, heavily dominated or rather influenced by their reptilian, by their instinctual, their instinctual nature, their very influence. Why? So the choices they will make will be according to, you could say, the reptilian or the, the instinctual mind. That's the reptilian, that's, that's the interpretation of these, of the Hebrew, we could say the Hebrew high science, right? Using the New Testament of the knowledge of things ethical and divine, right? And, and notice this, epinosis, knowledge here is also a divine feminine aspect, right? Because ones are looking at this whole male, female thing on the outside, but not on the inside. Right? And part of it is because the King James Version, the other versions, they lose the key. Because we study this, we can recognize, oh, that's a noun feminine, epinosis, or knowledge in that sense, which is that knowledge of he who be who he be, is feminine. How interesting. Recognition. Right? They can't recognize. And notice the word cognition. Cognition, at its root, has gnosis. Gnosis, right? Like they say, Gnostic, Gnosis, which is knowledge. Like Yeshua said, ye shall know the truth. Right? Have that experiential knowledge of the truth. That is, by implication, full discernment. Full discernment. They have a partial discernment. It's like the carnal, the fleshy. The carnal, the fleshy-minded, they are born again. Many of them are believers. But they, they only can deal with the simplest, the basic truth. It's like for years they've been serving the Lord, but they don't know more than somebody who just went through a couple of Bible schools. You know what I'm saying? Bible studies and Bible schools. You wonder why that is? Because of the carnal mind, right? And remember what it says? The change of mind. If Elohim perhaps gives them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. When I saw this verse, I was like, wow, that's deep right there. That, that those of us who truly have repented or have had a change of mind from, from, the, from the bad to the better, you know what I mean? From the stray way more to Yahweh, truth and life. With Zoh, HaDarek, this is the way. This means that, has he given us that? That ability to acknowledge the truth? A lot of times we say, well, I woke up, I accepted the truth. But notice sometimes the truth, when you accept something that's true, think about it. Have not you heard this before? Many times when we finally decide to accept something as the truth, if we're honest, we have heard it before. We might say, I like the way this person said it. I didn't like the way you said it, but I like the way they said it. But that should have nothing to do with the truth. So that means that they did not have the ability, some of their willpower to even understand was lacking. Here's verse 26 right here. And here's where, here's where the proverbial rubber meets the road and um, free will and the Bible. Right? Do, do, do people have free will? It all depends. Verse 26, and that they may recover themselves. Uh-oh. See, now you would think that God is going to save them, right? But it says that they may recover themselves, right? And not fail, right? Return to soberness, right? To sober up again, to regain one's senses, right? To out of their mind, you know, such kind of crazy questions. So instead of building up so that so they can walk it out and live it out, one dote about with questions, Right? And questions that can be simply answered, but instead they leave a lot of other ones who don't have that acknowledging of the truth right? in that delusional state that they think is true, but it's not. Right? When they say free will is an illusion. Ultimate free will, yes. There's some things I may want to do, but I recognize I, ca I can't even do it. I may not have the ability, so it's beyond my will. Right? Does that mean I don't have free will? No, that means my will right, cannot do that. Right? <laughs> Basically, but that they may recover themselves out of the sneer of Diablos. That they may do what? Recover themselves out of... So it's not the God of the Bible or the God of Israel, Yasharal. It's actually the God of the world flesh and the satanic seclorum, right? The sneer of Diablos. What does Diablos mean? Let's break it down to the simple metaphys metaphysics. Slander. The slander. So a lot of these ones that talk about, they, I believe in the Bible, but I'm a free thinker. Yeah, okay, all right. All right but, but you're under the slander. You know, you, 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 you're making traps for folks. 
It's going to be hard for folks to recover themselves out of your trap that you're laying for them. That's one of the sneers of Diablos, the slander, the adversarial mind, right? No pitchfork, you know, person or nothing like that. That's the way the world flesh and the satanic seclore make you believe. That's why people say, oh, you believe in the, the devil? You believe in somebody with a pitchfork and everything. You know, well, that's because that's how they have received it. Right? in this world. They have not studied to shoot themselves approved. We just showed you what Diablos is. It's, it's slander, slander, false accuser. It's not just speaking about a person, right? It's speaking about a mindset, right? If that gets in you or me, right, we can become that, that operative. We become an op of Diablos, a false accuser, slanderer, so forth and so on. You see how that works. But in the Hebrew, it's Satan. Satan is not some mythological, it's the adversarial mind. When you're in the true Hebrew HD consciousness, the adversarial mind, right? So when that adversarial mind takes over a person's will, right? This is one reason why you could say, okay, that person's a devil, right? In some sense, it could be true if it depends on the measure of their will that they have given over to the adversarial state of mind, that they have made the other choice. You know, like they said, when the heart is weighed against the feather, one's heart, right? And if, if their heart is heavier than the feather, you know what happens, right? They have given over their mind. They had a choice about it, right? Who are taken, but get this, who are taken captive. Notice what it says right here, that these people, this is all part of ministering like to us when we are out there and we're encountering different ones and we're so we're so joyed and and one could say iritically pumped up about the truth and then it falls flat on some ones and ones and we might think why are you opposing me why you're against me you know i'm your friend i'm trying to tell you why you can't get this to recognize that it might be beyond their will it might be outside of their will that's why i say it all depends now, free free will is not free in all not all have the same measure Right, of free will, right? That's why it was a good answer that Sonnet even said in that question with our black Jesus minister, it all depends. And that they may recover themselves out of the sneer of Diablos, the devil, right? The adversarial hasatan, the adversarial mind state, right? The unconsciousness, delusion, right? Who are taken captive by him at his will. Now notice this right here. Notice the word right there. It's saying that there are some people who are in the trap, the sneer of the adversarial mind. And we say the adversarial to the truth, we say of HaTorah, right? The truth of Yahweh and HaMushiach, Robeinu, right? They're in a trap. They're in a noose. It's like a sneer in which birds are entangled and caught. Let me, let me show you this. You know the bird, even from ancient Kemet, the Chetka Pata? Notice that the bird, right, this is what we call the, the bird of the soul, right? This is why even in ancient Egypt, they, they prefigured it, right, within the symbology as a bird. Even in the psalm that David says, how say you to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountains. So the soul and the bird connection. Notice what it says about these sneers. The sneers in which birds, souls, they catch souls, they catch people's psyche, they psych you out, are entangled and caught. This implies unexpectedly sudden because birds and beasts are caught unawares. Right? It's not like they say, oh, I'm about to get caught. Okay, let me just go ahead and get caught. No, it, it happens suddenly. A sneer, whatever brings peril, loss, destruction of a sudden, unexpected, deadly peril. Like a lot of these misteachers out there talking about the Torah and the Bible and rah, rah, rah. Right? And the allurements and seductions of Chat Iyad. Right? They get ones caught lacking. Right? Fukuri, ukuri. The allurements to lack. Chet, Chat Iyad. To miss the mark. That's what Sid means, missing the mark, right, of Yahweh, right? So they chose by choosing death, right, and cursing and consequences, right? Even through an exercise of their so-called will, that's still the choice factor. The allurements to Chatiyat by which Diablos holds one bound, right? Even this points out the sneers of love. I'm talking about the word love. Right? And the delusionment if one is not firmly rooted and grounded in the reality, right? But just in the hearsay, right? A trap as fastened by a noose. And those what a noose catch one? What, by the neck, right? Or a notch. Figuratively, it's a trick. It's trick knowledge, right? Like pseudo conscious folks, it's trick knowledge, a stratagem, it's a temptation, it's a sneer. 
But notice what it says right here. These have to, we basically, let's say we, we're in this situation together. We have to recover ourselves out of the sneer of Hasatan, of the adversarial mind. Right? This is why Yeshua, after his Moshiachship, went out here right, into the wilderness right, to test his Moshiachship against the adversarial mind, or as ones call it, the devil in the wilderness, who are taken captive. Right? The monks do this. The monks know this principle. The ascetics know this principle. The Bahitawi of Ethiopia, they know this principle. Right? By going out into the wilderness, right? in essence, into the solitary like the Horeb, Horeb, the other side of Sinai, figures into solitary, go into solitary. That's why most people in solitary confinement go crazy, go mad, go mad, right? Because then to be alone with oneself, they'll recognize that it's not really the self they thought was themselves because they have been taken captive by Diablos in that sneer. See, as long as they busy themselves, they don't really know themselves. You know, you know they busy themselves, but when you're alone sometimes, you know what I mean? Y'all, I think we all kind of know it. We've experienced it. Some experience it better and others experience it worse. But here it's saying that we would have to recover ourselves out of that trap, right? So we will first of all have to recognize we're in a trap and get to know, well, what is this trap? And who set this trap? Who is Diablos in the really real? Right? Who is Hasatan in the really real, right? And also recognize that we've been taken captive by him at his will. But how can we, if we have will, how can we be taken captive by him at his will? You know, like sometimes people don't want to do something because of somebody else. They don't want to say something because of somebody else. So like if I'm a person, I say, well, I don't want to say this because I don't want to offend this, this person. That means that particular person right there, I know I can, I have the ability to say it, but I'm allowing what would be my free will to say it Right, to be curtailed to a measure because of my lack of wanting to offend this or that person. Right? But it's still in my power. I still can say it. It's not like I'm, I, 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 I can't say it. I just chose, see? Choose life. Becharta, bechayin. Choose life. I made a choice. I made what they say a conscious decision. So those who are not <laughs> conscious, Right? Can they really make a conscious decision? That goes back to the verse. They've been taken captive. Notice that it's taken captive, like they've been enslaved. And we're not talking about physically. See, that's the whole thing about what is mentioned even in Timothy. It's not speaking physically. Even in the Torah and the Old Testament, it was not speaking physically. It was using the physical as an object lesson, right, of the immaterial, right, been taken captive. So they are not able to express that conscious, right, that conscious will, that conscious, like one is unconscious, right, to the things of Hilahim, to the things of the true good, the true God. So anyway, brothers and sisters, hope some of these verses here at least will um, prompt ones to study this for themselves, that yes, will exist. Ones do have will. As far as free will, one do have in measure the ability to choose, to decide. In some situations, some cases, even what we would choose or decide is not that we don't have the will. We don't have the means of accomplishing that will. It doesn't mean we don't have the will. It means that we don't have the means or the, the, the time, the situation, the opportunity. I'm a sniper. That's my target right there. My target's over there, but my target's being blocked. That means I don't got the shot. You see what I'm saying? When my target is not blocked, you know, and they say fire, then I got the shot. You see what I'm saying? So I have the will to shoot. Just because I can shoot, I recognize the target is not there, right? So if the command says fire, 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 like to shoot right now, I would say I don't got a clear shot. And they say fire, fire, fire. I, I'm, I might still, if I'm, a, if I'm a sniper, I'm a professional, I still might not because I will reveal my position, right, to the enemy and I will not accomplish anything against the enemy. You see what I'm saying? So there's free will in measure, right? We all have measures of free will, right? The thing that we should get to know instead of discarding that we have free will, that's like an excuse. That's like saying the devil made me do it, in a sense. Even though that particular verse in the Bible does kind of point out that some have given up their will. You see, the example I just gave where I said, well, I won't do something because I don't want to offend, you know, this person or that person. 
You know, you know the situation sometimes, oh, my mother, my mom's there, so I really don't want to, you know, use a certain kind of language, although I might use it elsewhere, right? I might even whisper it to somebody that this is what I mean, you know, fuckery, you know, but I don't want to say it out loud because I don't want to offend her, so forth and so on, because it says, honor thy father and thy mother, you know, reverence thy mother and thy father, so I don't want to offend her, right? Now, that might be a... a, a, a proper situation there are some proper situation where you don't want to you know where you choose not to you may want to but if you have any consciousness or self-control you know what i'm saying which is also a gift right you are able not to but if you give your mind and you can give your will over for example if i give my will over to bad people with bad consciousness and bad ideas after a while then even when i have a desire for the good i don't have the will to accomplish it right to will to do it like paul talks about that when he speaks about the nature of sin and so forth and so on right it doesn't mean that one does not have this but you can recognize that you get in so deep right sometimes that because you get in so deep your will, right, you exercise the restraint on your will. You still have will to do other things, but in this thing, right, you make a choice. As we said, you make a conscious choice, right, to do, right, or not to do. This is the whole point of the mashal, of the parable, right? You know, let's make this word... You know, the truth of this word, flesh. Let's walk it out in our life and liberty. Shalom, Chavarim. Shalom. So yes, free will does exist, but let's talk about will. But everybody is not free or might not choose to express their will so freely. Some might not even have the choice, as we mentioned in the um, verse from Timothy.